Welcome to What's Working. I'm Cam Marston, and I want to thank you for joining us for this week's show. Grateful for your attention. What's Working, for those unfamiliar, is the show focusing on workplace, workforce, and marketplace trends. Our goal is to find the trends that are shaping the workplace, the workforce, and the marketplace and explore them with a guest who can explain them to us in such a way that we come away from our time together just a little bit better at whatever it is that we do. I want you to apply the thinking on these trends, etc., to your home, your work, your family, your friends, whatever it may be. Our goal is to leave here a little bit better. Again, welcome to What's Working. I was unaware of the significance of trends in the landscape design world. Now, we've had greeneries on the show before, the places that grow the plants that ultimately maybe sell them to a Lowe's or a Home Depot, and then you and I buy them from there or sell them to the middleman. They grow them and sell them to the middleman. You and I buy them from there. Uh, So we've had these on the show, and that was a fascinating show, talking about patenting certain types of plants and licensing the use of plants. I was unaware that that world existed. It was was really interesting, something about a very unique azalea that was developed in Louisiana that's grown here, where this show was produced and broadcast in South Alabama, and how unique that relationship was. But moving on, I was unaware of the, uh, of the trends in landscape design. I figured landscape design is classical. Landscapes are going to look like landscapes did in the past, and it's based on what the soil will produce, what the climate will produce, and you actually have a limited palette, if you will, of what can go in the dirt around your house in terms of design. However, as I enjoy so often, I was wrong. I was wrong. And today, Catherine Ahrensberg is going to come in here and give us uh, a little insight into landscape design trends. If I recall correctly, she has a degree from LSU, which taught her how to do this. And she's going to explain to me some of the trends. As she and I were preparing for the show via phone call a couple weeks ago, she talked to me about the popularity of a gardenia, really, really fragrant flower. That's one of the ones that I do know about. But the popularity of a gardenia, however, she said, And this is fascinating to me. You can live in, let's say, Mitchell, South Dakota, and buy a gardenia from one of the greeneries, from one of the nurseries here in South Alabama, and they'll ship it to you. You likely do it through a Lowe's or a Home Depot website. They'll ship it to you, but there's little chance that that gardenia is going to make it in Mitchell, South Dakota. There is no consideration given the buyer is not alerted to the fact that, hey, The climate in Mobile, Alabama, where these gardenias are bred, and the climate in Mitchell, South Dakota, are remarkably different, not including even the soil. Um, But people are doing it all the time, she said, buying these plants that absolutely have no chance of making it where the plant is shipped, delivered, and ultimately planted. So we're going to talk about these landscaping trends, which I think is very interesting, um, and what is being sold to where, how it's being shipped. And then we're going to get into something that you know, social media to me is insidious. It's no way to other describe it, though I consume it. When it comes to uh, promoting my business through social media, I have never found success. It's hard, it's expensive, and each of the people that I've ever hired to do it for me come back and say, well, the reason it's not having the greatest results is you're not spending enough. What a wonderful thing to say for the consultant to say if you if you really don't like the way spending this amount feels double it and you'll see uh, you'll see different results maybe maybe and if those results don't work well then double it again Catherine has found the key to social media she's done very well with it particularly her youtube page and most remarkably to me she enjoys it and i'm hoping to get a little bit of her mojo so that i can take the same attitude with my own stuff You're listening to What's Working. I'm Cam Marston. When we come back from this break, I'll have Catherine Ahrensberg across from me. She and I will talk about trends in the landscaping business. We'll be right back. This is Seth Cherniak, Vice President of Branch Development for the Jeffrey Matthews Financial Group. 
If you're an experienced financial advisor wanting the freedom of independence, but aren't sure making that jump is right for you, we should talk. Jeffrey Matthews has developed a successful program for advisors who don't want to be 1099 contractors and don't want to pay for their own overhead. We're looking for advisors who want the freedom to run their business the way they see fit with the support that comes with a W-2 firm. If you're interested in joining one of our branches, or if you want to open your own branch as a full-time employee, let's chat. Our compensation plan is one of the most competitive among all W-2 firms, big or small. Reach out to us today at jeffreymatthews.com, connect with me, Seth Cherniak, on LinkedIn, or click the link in the podcast. Jeffrey Matthews Financial Group, member FINRA, SIPC. You're listening to What's Working. I'm Kim Marston. We're back. I'm sitting across from Katherine Ahrensberg. She's a landscape architect with a background from LSU. And we're going to talk about architecture or landscape architectural trends. And then we're going to go off the beaten path and get into social media, which is not exactly what you would have in mind for a show focusing on landscape architecture. Catherine, thank you so much for your time. Welcome to What's Working. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. To get all the guests clear, tell me exactly what a landscape architect is. I think most people probably have an idea, but what do you spend your time doing each day for your customers? So my degree in landscape architecture covered an awful lot of things. People in my field can do everything from urban design all the way down to residential design. And I chose to follow the path of residential because it's interesting to me. And so I try to describe, usually I describe uh, myself as an interior designer for the outside. So most people would imagine that I just know plants and things like that. But we do everything from where your pool's going to be sited, where the fence is going to go, where the, you know, driveway, how it's going to wind around. The plants are kind of the jewelry. They're kind of the last thing that happens. I also pick paint colors for people's shutters, decide what material their porches and patios are going to be, what their fireplace is going to be made out of. So it's the gamut of anything you do outside. It sounds much more comprehensive than even I had imagined. Tell me what this study at LSU, you spent, uh, what, what was the most difficult part of earning that degree? Where, where, was the, where was the difficulty in earning that degree? The thing you struggle with the most? The difficulty for each individual person varies, I think, because landscape architecture at LSU starts your freshman year, and it's five years. It is a five-year degree. Uh, And so when you start in landscape architecture, if you decide you wanted to hop out and do something else, you have to start all over. Oh wow! Most landscape architecture classes do not translate to anything else. At least they didn't at the time when I was in school. And so... Once I got in, I was in. Lots of late nights, lots of big projects. You basically spent your life in the design building. Your friends would just kind of wave as they would pass by going to other activities that they were doing. Right. So I would say it was probably the, just the time. Just, you're, you're dedicated. So there was nothing that was overwhelmingly difficult to learn. Like me going through organic chemistry would be so very difficult for a guy like me. It was just the commitment to the process. I think so. But also every school of landscape architecture at every different college is different. They focus on different things. So Mississippi, it was my understanding that they do a lot of construction. Uh Auburn, you know, probably focuses more on the horticulture. And LSU very heavily dedicate themselves to conceptual design. And what that means is um, how the space flows. Right. And so I had a hard time. I have a very logical brain. But I am a creative person. And so I think I had a really hard time wrapping my brain around kind of more of a flowy, loose, not not real mathematical type way of looking at things. Right. But it has hugely benefited me in my career now because that is the thing that people come to me for is understanding how people live their lives and then creating a space that basically puts all those elements into a beautifully designed space. Talk to me about the customer now. What are your customers looking for? What are the trends in their request? If you were to, for example, if you say to me, gosh, Cam, if someone comes to me and asks for another pergola, I'm going to lose my mind or something (laughs) like that. Everybody wants one. They're a bad idea. What are the trends in landscape architecture that you're seeing from your customer demands? Well, it's funny that that you mentioned the, the pergola thing. I would say that my customers 
and I know we'll talk about it later with social media, but I do think that my customers come to me because they want me and they trust that I'm going to provide the idea for them that is best, even if they kind of already had their heart set on something else like a pergola. You mentioned that, and that is kind of funny because so many people do want pergolas. And my advice always immediately is, we got to put a roof on it. You're never going to use it in our environment. It rains so much here to sit under something that doesn't have any kind of protection from the rain. But I would say the number one thing that I have to talk people out of, and it doesn't take me long to talk them out of it, is putting some sort of outdoor kitchen or space, entertainment space, far out away from your home. Yeah, It needs to be close to your back door or you will not use it. Basically, your outdoor kitchen needs to be relatively close to your indoor kitchen because you're going to be schlepping vegetables and meats and all kinds of stuff out to the grill. And you're not going to use that beautiful $50,000 new outdoor kitchen if it's 100 yards out. People think, I'm going to create like a a getaway, an oasis. A second home, a pool house. Yes, but we need to create practicality is what we need to do. That's interesting. So the distance between the back door. No, you said the distance between your current kitchen to the outdoor kitchen needs to be minimal. Yes. Or else it will not be used. Correct. Yeah. What about, uh, so I see, uh, this is something my wife and I have talked about. We want to put a roof out back over the fireplace or around the fireplace, put a television out there because we've got this beautiful backyard or this beautiful fireplace that we seldom use. Mm-hmm. Um, but the the logistics of finding a way to get that to work is is proving to be very difficult for us. Are you seeing more and more people want to do what she and I have talked for years about doing, and that is building that outdoor space? Is that a trend? Absolutely. Ever since COVID happened and everybody stayed home, um, I mean, we're four years past the beginning of COVID at this point, and we are still seeing people wanting to create outdoor spaces that feel like they're indoor, you know, style and all that, but pulled outside. Yeah. What about plants and uh, greenery and things of that nature? Are there trendy plants to have? I'll tell you myself, I went through an orchid phase. I thought they're beautiful (laughs) and I wanted more and more. And I've got some, some of the skeletons of those orchids are around my house right now. But are there are there trends in uh, in plants and of things course. like that? Of course, yes. There's always trends in plants. You know, when it comes to there's a difference between something that you might put on your table on your patio, uh, like an orchid or like a succulent. Succulents were huge for a while, uh, along with fiddle leaf figs. That's another kind of indoor plant that people love to put in their homes because they've got these big beautiful branches. But most of us kill them. Yes. So between succulents and fiddle leaf figs and orchids, these are all three of those plants. Um, have real interesting water requirements that's complicated when it gets into having central heat and air. You know, all those things suck the moisture out of plants, and so you have to water them at at kind of weird times in comparison to what you would do if they were outside. Right. And so those are all trendy plants. I think people have finally realized they're not as easy as what you might think because all of those plants we just listed are supposed to be the easiest plants on the planet to take care of, and they give us all so much trouble. Yeah. But as far as um, trends on the outside of your home, landscape-type plants, garden type plants. White and green have been popular for a few years now. The same as interiors, right? White walls, light colored walls and things like that. People want that clean look. And then also hydrangeas. Hydrangeas, I'm not sure will ever go out of style. They're very traditionally Southern. And I know you have a a larger audience than just the South, but those by far always will be the most popular. They're pink, they're blue, they're white. They come in different shapes and sizes and and things like that, but they're the most popular. Hydrangeas, we have we have some in our in our yard, some of which used to bloom magnificently, but have since kind of uh, petered out, I guess. I don't know what the cause of that is, but uh, it's interesting that you mentioned fiddle figs because I've got some carcasses of fiddle figs around the house do. too. <laughs> and I keep looking at them saying, well, I just need to bring them out uh, to the curbside on Thursday so they'll get picked up and, and taken away because there's they're gone. Um, there are, just like you said, listeners across the country here, and they can buy these plants online. They can go and click and say, that looks beautiful. I want that for my yard. But that can't be a good series of decision-making considering we've got m- listeners in South Dakota who could be buying pro- plants grown here in the Deep South. I mean, what should a buyer think about as they're looking for plants for their yard in different parts of the country? Well, I think it depends on what you're purchasing it for. If it's going to be a house plant, any house plant that you see that we purchase here, whether you purchase it from your local big box store or garden center, an indoor plant 
didn't live indoors. It's naturally outside somewhere, right? Probably in the tropics, somewhere where it's hot all the time. And so you just have to know, you have to understand the light requirements and the watering requirements for any of these things. And they've the, the nurseries have gotten a lot better about telling you if it needs low light or highlight and all that stuff. But you have to under, educate yourself on what those things mean. Indoor light, when you when it says it needs bright light, you need to be putting it by a window that gets a large amount of light. Yeah, You just have to know what you're getting yourself into. I'm sitting across from Catherine Ehrensberg. She's got a degree from LSU in landscape architecture. We're talking about trends in her business. We're going to get back into that. And I'm particularly interested in the, the outdoor structure design because I there seems to be a A great thirst for that these days, all since COVID, if I understand. You're listening to What's Working. I'm Cam Marston. We'll be back after this. This is Bill Eastett. I perfected my baking recipe behind my live music stage at my little restaurant in Fairhope, Alabama. We have custom-made smokers and small batch bacon made just for you. So if you're looking for the best bacon in America that has been cured, smoked, and even serenaded by songwriters, you definitely need to try Billy's Small Batch Bacon. www.billysbacon.com We're back. You're listening to What's Working. I'm Cam Marston. Sitting across from me is Catherine Ehrensberg. We're talking landscape architecture. We're talking uh, backyard design and the trends that go into that. We talked about colors that were important to homeowners. We talked about uh, climate uh, ability for the different plants that you buy. Catherine, one of the things that, well, pools, swimming pools. I have a neighbor in my neighborhood who, who filled his up, didn't want it anymore, filled it up. I have other neighbors that are digging ones out in order to create them. What are the trends in pools? Well, again, since 2020, everyone wanted a pool. They built more pools in in our area in the last four years than probably in the last 20 combined. But certainly as far as uh, pool design is concerned, most people are doing a gunite pool, which is the plaster that you see, the smooth, you know, hard, not a liner and not a, uh, there's also a fiberglass option. Mm -hmm. Um, They're also, we've moved heavily away from, you know, curvy shapes, and things like that to more of a rectangular style and into things like cocktail pools or plunge pools, which are smaller, but it still gives you that water feature outside without as much cost as a, a traditional pool. The other thing we're seeing is sun tanning ledges on pools. So you've kind of got that shallow area that you merge into a pool rather than having the traditional staircases that go into pools. So what is the profile of a family or an individual wanting a pool? Is it a family or is it a uh, an elderly couple or is it all over? It's all over. It's everything in between. People are getting older and want their grandkids to come over more often. So they want something to be in the yard that they can always have something for them to do and it's also upcoming you know families with younger children who know that they're going to be staying in that home they they don't want to take vacations necessarily and they feel like that's a good investment in their home for years to come and are there trends in the 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 plants the horticultural around the pool people want of this people want of that they want to make it look tropical whatever believe it or not the trend that i'm seeing down here is the people want for sod or faux turf to come right up to either the edge of the pool or the pool deck itself people are really going for a minimalist clean very formal look around their pools which i think aids itself when you're talking about going from curvy and all that, which I think that was when the tropical stuff was more popular, to now we've got these rectangular straight lines and then very clean landscape lawns going up right up to the pool. Do you like that? I do. do. You you like that look? I do. Yeah. Just a personal preference. But I design for for anything and everything in between. So my job is is to design for the client and how they live their life. I do very heavily warn against doing something that has a ton of different plant material because it adds to maintenance. And that's another conversation I have with my clients all the time. I think the the sod is so popular because it's very easy to hire a lawn service to come and take care of it. Way easier to cut a lawn on a 26-inch blade than it is to pull weeds out of beds. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense to me. 
you go to a house they've they've invested in your services their landscape architecture their design is beautiful is it reasonable to think that that homeowner at some point would say you know it's time to redo all this or is it once in the ground that is the look of the house does anybody ever pull everything up and say let's let's take another look at this house let's do it differently or does a plant ever age out now that the plant is 10 years old it's no longer it's no longer has the same characteristics it had when it was planted it's time to pull it up and start again so yes um i wouldn't say that individual homeowners that have owned a home that just in, you know installed it hopefully they're not pulling things up and starting over but yes after a long period of time plants are living breathing things and even though the tag on the plant might say it gets three to five feet tall, crazy things happen and it grows way too big in its spot. To me, the best landscape is one that is a mix of new and old material. Mm -hmm. So ideally what you're doing is you're going and plucking out some of the old stuff, putting new things in, but that's generally not how we live our lives anymore. I mean, people are very much so foundational landscape. They want it done. Um, And so the nice thing about that in our current year of 2024 is that the nursery industry has expanded to such a point where there's a dwarf version in different size uh, plants and different color blooming in almost every plant that you can imagine to fit whatever space that you're in so that when it gets to maturity, um, it's not taking over the area. So as long as you can plant it and wait for it to get to maturity and just be patient with it, you will eventually get a very full mature looking landscape that can look fresh for a long time as long as if you shove the plants too close together um, and they mature it's going to look bad but if you can let those plants reach reach their full maturity and give them some space you'll have a fresh looking landscape for a lot of years so it seems to me that after covid or perhaps during covid people were really invested in their yards getting them look that's kind of what we were restricted to not less social ability so let's focus on the yards however and this is one person's observation of my own neighborhood I don't see anybody in their yards working anymore in my neighborhood. It seems right. as if there was a big trend, and I'll point to myself. I was very interested at one point in those hydrangeas that we mentioned earlier. I was very proud of them, and I would wade through them. They were about waist high, and they had these huge blooms over there. They're not doing well anymore, and I just don't care. It seems like maybe there was, that's not why they're that's maybe, maybe that's, that's why, why they're not doing well. It's a good point. It's a good point, but I um. I have lost my energy around my yard. And as I look up and down the street, it seems that my neighbors have too. I mean, and I've not talked to them about it. I have not said, why do you no longer spend time in your yard? But it seems as if there was this rush of interest. And now if it's greenish and it grows-ish, leave it. Mm -hmm. Do you see that going on? I I would agree with that. But I I knew that was going to happen from the time that all that rush kind of happened. And so that's why I try really hard to have the conversations with my clients about being honest with themselves about maintenance, not maintenance now, maintenance five years from now, because you might be all excited about it now, but the, in the long term, you know, it's the same thing with things like fountains. People want a big fountain in their yeah. backyard. Let's talk about the maintenance of a fountain. We're not talking about the cost that it, it is to install that fountain, but, you know, it has a pump in it. There's power that has to go to it. It has to make sure that you've got water in it so it's not running dry unless you've got an auto off for the pump. There's a lot that goes into a fountain. People want that beautiful sound and all that. If you want that, let's talk about maybe maybe a porch fountain that you just plug in and you pour a little bit of water into. So we just try to come up with different ideas to achieve the same thing. Um, after me having a lot of conversation, I mean, so much of my job is just having conversations, learning people, um, to really get down deep as to, to how they're going to use the space in a really practical way. And let me tell you, when you walk into someone's home, you can see what their interior maintenance looks like. And I can usually project what their exterior maintenance will be as well. Oh, please don't come to my house. I hope that nothing ever happens that would cost you to come to my house. <laughs> I'm not judging your it. Your judgment would no. be swift and and clear. It's not a judgment. It's never a judgment. It is it is understanding the truth of a situation. Yeah. It, it, is, it is not a judgment call at all. It is a matter of me being able to give you what you truly need and not what you think you want. How much of the education at LSU prepared you to have to talk to customers and clients about their habits, their behaviors, their their attitudes towards if it's green, leave it. I would say none. None. <laughs> no. So you developed an extraordinary uh, 
catalog of information taught to you about LSU, but the majority of your work is psychological on your clients. I think that's true of any any college major. You learn the nuts and bolts, but when it comes down to it, there's an awful lot that you learn in the field. And, um, you know, the process of hiring someone, it's an emotional one. There's a lot of money involved. You have to make sure that you're hiring the right person. Um, and so I understand. I mean, I came from, I'm, I'm one of six children. I came from uh, you know, middle class type background and spending money was always a big decision in how you did it. So I know that I'm a luxury for people and I want for them to feel happy with the process and feel like when they got to the end of it that they didn't just, you know, waste their money. Yeah. So that's important to me. How do you know when a client's happy? And no one, in my experience, no one ever comes to me and says, I'm unhappy with that. They don't comment. They will gush if they do, if I did well but they don't comment when they feel like it didn't work out. When you know a client is happy, what do they tell you? Um, well, they'll they'll send reviews. Um, and some a lot of times they don't gush even if they do like it. I send Christmas cards every year. And uh, if I get a note back telling me how much they love their landscape because I communicated with them first, then I know. That sounds good. Now, when we come back from break, here's some numbers that I want to talk about. 8,000 YouTube followers, 26,000 Instagram followers, 5,000 plus Facebook followers. You seem to have capitalized on the world of social media, which is an area which I continue to struggle with. And it may be because I'm over the hill and I'm free to admit that. I have no problems admitting that. We're going to talk to you about your social media strategy and how you're using it to grow your business. We'll be right back. You're listening to What's Working. I'm Cam Marston. This is Seth Cherniak, Vice President of Branch Development for the Jeffrey Matthews Financial Group. If you're an experienced financial advisor wanting the freedom of independence, but aren't sure making that jump is right for you, we should talk. Jeffrey Matthews has developed a successful program for advisors who don't want to be 1099 contractors and don't want to pay for their own overhead. We're looking for advisors who want the freedom to run their business the way they see fit with the support that comes with a W-2 firm. If you're interested in joining one of our branches, or if you want to open your own branch as a full-time employee, let's chat. Our compensation plan is one of the most competitive among all W-2 firms, big or small. Reach out to us today at jeffreymatthews.com, connect with me, Seth Cherniak, on LinkedIn, or click the link in the podcast. Jeffrey Matthews Financial Group. Member FINRA, SIPC. You're listening to What's Working. I'm Cam Marston. I'm in the studio today. Catherine Ehrensberg is a landscape designer, landscape architect, and she and I are talking about, we have been talking about, trends in the business all very fascinating to me but one of the things Catherine, that you've done so well and that i you're not supposed to covet things but i (laughs) covet your social media success as i said in the introduction before you were in the studio with me it seems to be an insidious world but when you look at the success that you've had and i'll say these numbers again i said them in the previous segment 8,000 YouTube followers, 26,000 Instagram followers, 5,000 plus Facebook followers. These are great numbers for uh, for someone like me. Your success on social media has generated, I'm suspecting, a lot of interest from people who ultimately became customers. Yes. And I want to talk to you because I the listeners out there, I think, are very similar to me. Like, what is this stuff? I, I consume it out of uh, out of pleasure, but I can't figure out how to utilize it for commercial purposes. Give me your philosophy of social media, what you're doing, and maybe some tips, and we'll go from there. I think that people want to hire people. I think they want to hire real people. And in my business, you're essentially hiring a custom artist, right, to create something for you. So before you hire that that person to create something custom for you, you want to know that you can trust them, that they're going to listen to you, and that they're going to be easy to work with. And so my social media is essentially dedicated to showing people that I'm knowledgeable in my field, 
through reels and stories and things like that on Instagram and on YouTube and uh, in stories, which is more of the daily content type stuff, being a real human. I go on there every day with no makeup on, not every day with no makeup, but people that's been the feedback that I've gotten back is we love it. It's so funny because it kind of is a little bit of a backhanded compliment. But it's something to the effect of we just love how real you are. You know, you come on there with no makeup. You don't care. Your hair isn't done. I'm like, OK, well, <laughs> I can understand. Thanks. That. Yeah. But um, but yeah, I don't care. Um, And it never really struck me as being important to people until they started telling me about it. Yeah. So what is your goal? What is the goal? What is your social media goal? Uh, is it to get a national sponsor? Is it to continue to get um, connection with customers? What do you, when you sit down each day to create a social media plan for the day, and maybe that's a line of conversation we can have. So I don't. I don't do. I don't do any really planning. I enjoy the filmmaking of it. I enjoy making videos. It's gotten to be such a habit, which I know is the hardest part for people to get into the habit of posting on social media, but it's become such a habit for me that it's it's more difficult for me to not do it. It feels weirder for me to not do it. I would say that my goal is to have more of an audience nationwide because the videos right now are my product as far as a national audience is concerned. I'm not designing. I can do virtual designs and consult with people across the country, but as a uh, individual plant availability and what grows in different hardiness zones, I can't offer that at this time. Um, but certainly the goal is just to have more people educated on you know, what what is happening in their yard, who to trust as far as contractors are concerned. We don't just talk design. We also talk industry generally, because I think as much of a risky thing or a scary thing as it is to hire a designer, it's very scary for people to hire contractors because they've had a lot of people have had sure. bad experiences. And so it's what to look for, what questions to ask, you know, that type thing. So I just try to be helpful. So what is the, how do you pick the content? How do you know what you're going to you don't just turn the camera on and record whatever comes out of your mouth. I would assume that you sit there for a moment or two and think, well, this is on my mind today. Therefore, I'm going to present it this way. Yes. When it comes to the daily content stuff, that is very much off the cuff, whatever's happening. I mean, yesterday I was talking about Olestra. I mean, which is, if you remember Olestra, I mean, it has nothing to do with landscape at all, right? That's in my daily content. <laughs> <laughs> so Alestra was the additive that they did to chips or something like that that, yeah. that backfired, right? Yeah. Well, Starbucks now has a drink that has a new uh, product in it that sounds very similar to that and yeah. is having similar uh, reactions. I see. And so anyway, we just talked about that. It's just fun, you know, silly stuff. Sometimes it is. I'll take people on my job sites with me. We'll film that. So there is some planning. If I'm going to be on a job site, of course, I'm going to pick up the camera and we're going to talk about it. Um, and then as far as you know, stuff that lives in my feed, I would say, as far as videos and the things that go on YouTube, those are me standing next to a plant talking about those things. And a lot of those are dictated by the projects that I'm currently installing or the plants that are growing right now in my local area. And, you know, I know this is a national program, but people really appreciate learning about plants here locally. They love that I'm a local person talking about local things because um, there's no one else talking about why, you know, what that the tree that they drive down the street looking at. It's so beautiful and it's blooming. What is that? And they know that they can come to my page and I'll be talking about it. Yeah. Yeah. Who is your competition? So considering your social media prolific work, and your designation, who do you consider as your competition? It's terrible to say I don't have any competition because that's such a silly thing to say. I guess there's always competition, but there's no one doing exactly what I'm doing, which is residential landscape design, you know, with a, a lot of video content. Um, there is a woman in... Uh, I think she's in Georgia, named Carmen Johnson. She has a partnership with Southern Living Plant Collection that I have been dying to have forever and ever. So if you want to talk about coveting things and, <laughs> and, and jobs and things, that has always been a goal um, to be working with some sort of company, you know, like Southern Living Plants or somebody that is a nationally known brand yeah. that I can be the spokesperson or host videos for them. So you're looking for... Your goal is to continue to get more and more attention and more followers through your social media by producing quality content reliably and regularly. Mm -hmm. And I think I think that doors will open from that exposure. Yeah. I mean, they always have, and I think they always will. Yeah. So uh, you told me there was I, I want to get back to a conversation you and I had on the phone as we scheduled this, and that was you got into landscape architecture 
because as you told me you would be laying in the grass playing with the flowers with your aunt Mm -hmm. and since a child people would say to you this is what you need to do yeah so you just followed their advice but at one day on campus at lsu you said you know what i'm not so sure i like this anymore yeah it's a lot of work it's a lot of work but and this is but i mean what else was i gonna do too you have found a way to make it interesting you have taken something that you were dubious about and found a way to make it a, a passion. Yeah, when I was so I was a stay at home mom. Um, my husband was a school teacher for 20 something years um, and we started having babies. I was working at a landscape architecture's office. And when we started having kids, I decided that I wanted to stay home with them. But I can't keep still. That's just not who I am. And so I started doing all kinds of things. I was already working with the landscape architect that I had gone to work for, doing drawings for him at home, doing CAD plans for him at home, you know, just kind of helping out with the extra things he needed. And so I tried to take on some clients for myself. So I tried other things. I tried making little baby onesies. I tried, you know, and sold those. And it was fine. They sold. I did. I mean, I'm I'm creative and they did well. I made chocolate covered pretzels and things like that. I tried other things. And I think at some point I stepped back and I thought, these things are fine. But the amount of time they're taking away, I was trying to stay home with the kids, but I also wanted to make a little money. And the amount of time it was taking me to do those things didn't yield nearly as much time or money as doing what I went to school for, which was landscape design. So I decided, Catherine, you're going to have to find a way to make this work. Yeah. So I I read four Gary Vaynerchuk books, I think, um, and just learned an overall idea of creating content, um, which they call it content now. I don't know that's what it was called in the books. It was probably just called video. Yeah. Um, And so I bought a camera. I started doing video. I really enjoyed the process of all of it. And it's so funny because now people will go, you're a natural on camera. Y'all go back and watch what I call season one of my show. It is rough, rough, rough because I'm not a natural on camera. I've been practicing for 10 years now. Um, But I, I really did love that. And I thought, okay, I can utilize this to forward my business and make money and spend time with my kids. Win, win. How can people find you? Uh, my Instagram is Catherine Aaronsberg. My YouTube is Simple Honest Design. If you just Google my name, Catherine Aaronsberg with a B E R G, you'll find me. And it's A R E N S B E R G. Catherine Aaronsberg, folks, landscape architect, found a way to love what she's doing and very good at it. Catherine, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. We'll be back after this break with segment five. I'll tell you what I heard and what you can expect coming up. You're listening to What's Working. I'm Cam Marston. Be right back. I'm Joey Mason. For four years, my goal has been to produce the best farm-to-table products I'd ever eaten. I've done just that at our on-site USDA facility in Grand Bay, Alabama, allowing us to ship directly to your door. This is true farm-to-table. Visit us at masonhillsfarm.com to see all that we have to offer. Listening to What's Working, I'm Cam Marston. Welcome back to Segment 5. For the regular listeners, you'll know that Segment 5 is where we kind of digest everything that we've heard, notes to take away, ideas, what are the trends that we can apply to our business, to our lives, etc. Something that Catherine, and I, I tell you, I like Catherine Ehrensberg. She's got her act together. I could clearly see that and feel that with her. But something that she said that came out in the interview that she actually articulated once it was over is something that I continue to work on, a challenge of my own that I continue to work on. And that is that she said, uh, if things are meant to be for the growth of a business, then they're going to make themselves known to you. And there are those out there, I'm sure, that are hearing this and rolling their eyes. But And it's a message that I've received several times over the past, uh, I don't know, months or something. And it's this. And I read this in a book and I can see the book. It's on the table next to me over there. The more we strive for success, the less likely that success is to find us. Striving is about trying to force things to happen. 
Striving is about pushing where the evidence suggests that we're pushing too hard. And it's something that I continue to struggle with. And after the microphones were off, Catherine and I continued to talk about that a little bit, is that I can see visions for where the show could be, where my business could be, etc. And I strive to make it happen, whereas more often than not, there's an opportunity awaiting for me somewhere nearby that if I weren't working so hard on striving, then the opportunity would present itself to me. Catherine said she wanted to be very clear with her social media viewers and listeners, etc. She also has a podcast. You can search for her name on the podcast. Um, she wants her social media followers to believe her. They want to see her as transparent, as not a shell for something, and uh, that, that she's not pushing something that is not good, that she wants to be trustworthy by her viewers and listeners. And I hope that's what this show continues to bring you is your belief in uh, in me and the trustworthiness of the stuff that I try to deliver. But that's what she uses, she says, social media for is, is a, a big part of it is trying to be trustworthy to her viewers, which is great advice for those of us that struggle with how to make the social media stuff happen. So I told you we, we were investing in it, that it was a big part of 2024. And you will see that if you want to follow me on social media, you can find me at Cam Marston. On many of the social media outlets, I think Instagram, we're Cam Marston, the numeral one, Cam Marston one. And I hope you'll enjoy this ride as we try to figure out what that niche means for me in that social media world. Uh, there is uh, a lot to learn from trends in the landscape architecture business. And I thought it was very interesting that she said the, the bulk of the work she's had to learn did not come in college. It came in learning through the flames with those customers on their site, how to relate with people, how to figure out what was important to them, not the technical stuff that was taught through CAD designs, et cetera, at LSU, but a lot of eye contact time with their customers. And I suspect there's not a business or a profession out there where that is not the case. You get the education you need, whether it's in some sort of mentorship or formal education, but the real learning comes looking in those customers' eyes. We'll have another show next week. Have a good week, everybody. As you likely know, this show originates as a radio show broadcast across the state of Alabama, and it continues to grow in both radio listeners and market. After it's formatted for radio, we then turn it into this podcast. Please share it with those you think would find it interesting and subscribe to the podcast on my YouTube page where you can leave messages and your thoughts and your comments and I'll certainly get back in touch. Finally, if you're a fan of the show, please offer a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. You can find my book called What Works on Amazon.com. In it, I highlight the top 10 ideas from the first 200 episodes of the show. Mind you, they're not the top 10 best episodes. They're the top 10 best ideas. Many times the same ideas are brought up again and again by different guests, and we dig into those ideas in such a way that they'll be easily applicable for your business. Simply go to Amazon and enter my name, and you'll find what works as well as my other books. Chapter titles include How to Find a Niche, Innovation, Building Teams, and so forth. To learn more about the workshops and seminars I offer, go to cammarston.com. There you can view clips of my work, view workshop titles, view my reviews, case studies, customer lists. It's all there. If you'd like a free copy of one of the chapters of my book, enter your email address at the bottom of the homepage at cammarston.com. And from that site, you can email me directly. I always love to hear from you. You'll also find me on social media. Find Cam Marston on all the social media platforms, and you may need to enter the numeral one. There's one other Cam Marston out there. And that numeral one distinguishes me from him from time to time. So if you're unsure if it's me or not, enter that numeral one after my name and it should do the trick. On a more personal and less professional side, I record weekly commentaries that air across Alabama on Alabama Public Radio twice each day on Fridays called Keeping It Real. They've won statewide and national awards. They're simple observations on the world as it goes on around me. And they're only a few minutes long. They're a passion. You can find them on the same podcast app you're using to listen into this. Finally, if you're interested in advertising on this podcast or the radio show, reach out. I've worked hard to cultivate a specific listener, and I can tell you all about them, and I have many different options for helping you reach them. Thanks again for listening. 
We'll have another episode available soon.